Today's topic is introduction to GlyphWorks for durability analysis. Um, my name is Mir Rafe, and I will be your presenter today. Uh, the focus of today's webinar is uh, fatigue and durability processing in ENCODE. Um, please note this is going to be a more a software focused presentation and uh, less conceptual. We'll probably spend next 45 minutes or so uh, going over different tools and techniques uh, we have in ENCODE to make our products better and more durable. Here is our agenda. Let's take a look. So um, we'll be starting out with an introduction to an engineering challenge, um, then re reviewing the objectives. Um, we'll then dive into software and explore how we can use input clipworks to uh, visualize and analyze peak performance. That's line number three. Uh, once we have assessed our peak performance, we'll provide some design improvement directions uh, in, in line number four. And at last, we'll also look at how ENCODE can extend its analysis capabilities when working with not just a single test or a single event, but um, with a full durability schedule test, test run. Uh, but before we get started, let me provide a quick overview of who we are as a company. Um, you have seen HBK logos in this presentation, including this slide uh, on the bottom right corner. So HBK is our parent company, and Prancia is a software division within HBK. Um, many of you probably are familiar with the brand ENCODE or Reliasoft. Uh, together, they form the Prancia brand, which you can think of as a software division for uh, durability and uh, reliability software and solutions. In, in addition to our software portfolio, we also provide training, education, and engineering services. Um, here you can see our different software offerings on both ENCODE and the Liosoft side. Um, however, in today's webinar, we'll be using, our focus will be on using this Glyphworx software. All right then, let's uh, get to it. So let me start by uh, giving you an intro to uh, our engineering challenge today. So let's assume we work for a bike manufacturing company who makes high-end performance bikes like the one you see in this picture. So, so really there are two things at hand here. First, we need this bike to be light, but also durable. The first task, which is to make this bike light, is done, is complete. So the, the bike has already been light rated for performance uh, improvements, performance reasons, uh, but now we need to make sure that, uh, that it is still, uh, the design is still durable enough. In other words, we need to validate that the light rating of our bike did not compromise the structural durability, and also that it can last X number of years, X number of hours um, based on our target life. So, and for that reason, we're now testing our bike with some onboard sensors, which we can then use to analyze the bike's performance. So here's a, a close-up shot. Uh, you may be able to see some onboard equipment on this bike. Uh, let me go to the next slide, put more focus on um, close-up shots on some of these uh, transducers. So, <clears throat> um, as you can see here, we are using a bunch of transducers. Um, uh, to be specific, we have a total of 17 channels in this test. Um, we have accelerometers, we have GPS uh, to know where we are on the map. Uh, we have cameras. We have three different cameras mounted uh, uh, in, in three different angles, capturing video footage of the test and, and, and others. Um, all this data is really useful. But there's one sensor in particular that is core of our analysis, and that is a strain gauge. You can't really see that strain gauge in these images, but it is mounted on a seat rail, uh, a key structural component we are interested in in this analysis. So seat post mounted strain gauge will help us 
identify the structural performance, structural durability performance of this component. So the next set of objectives are um, simply to look at our measured signals, see what we can learn from it. Um, once we understand our test data, we can then use it to analyze uh, uh, fatigue variability performance. And at the end, we can make a conclusion based on that assessment. So that's pretty much our objectives in a nutshell. Okay. So I think this is a good time for me to um, uh, switch to ENCODE software and um, do a demo on our test data. Here I have a starting template. Uh, I already configured it uh, to save some time. Um, we're not doing any fatigue assessment yet. Uh, we're first, we're going to look at this data set. So, In the available data, I have a time series test uh, named Highway 151 Descent, and I also have three separate video files, which you can also see their snapshot in, in the video display on the right. So let me uh, uh, drag uh, this test in the time series input. And um, I, I, I dragged and dropped my, my test data, and if I maximize this, um, here are the channels we discussed earlier. Um, you can shuffle it through. We have 17 channels. Uh, one channel in particular uh, that, that we're interested in is, is this uh, seat rail strain gauge, channel number 17, this guy. Okay. Um, so this is a channel we're also going to use for uh, in our strain life analysis process. But before we do any sort of analysis, any fatigue calculation, I would like to get an insight of my test run, a better understanding of my test data. Um, one way to do it is by looking, um, looking at these peak levels and ask yourself, what are the peaks in my test and where are they happening? This way we get a better understanding of how the test was performed how the road conditions were, uh, how the test conditions were, and uh, also how the test article was handled. So looking closely on just my strain gate channel, I can see uh, here are my peak uh, in this segment. Here are my peak strain levels, about 2,600 microstrain in max and about 1,200 microstrain in min. Uh, and these peak strains are happening at, at around this segment, this uh, 400 seconds mark on the x-axis. So, so I'm thinking there is something going on uh, in this small segment, and I'm curious to find out more. So what's causing these peaks? Uh, lucky for us, we have GPS and video data synced with the rest of time series channels. That means we can now further investigate the cause of these peak strains right around that 400 seconds mark. So let me go ahead and run this process. Uh, here you're going to see a couple different things. Um, first, uh, the GPS display represents the complete test run from the start point to the end point. The green dot here um, represents the start. The red represents the end of this test. And I also have an XY display um, focusing on just the strain channel. Now, because they're all synced with each other, uh, when I run this video, you'll see two cursors being tracked. There will be a cursor on the GPS, a black cursor following the route, and also a line cursor on the XY display uh, moving along the x-axis. Also note that this test is, um, if, we, if we close up, this test is about 480 seconds long, uh, but the video is only about one minute. So this video um, is not, is not uh, through, through, throughout the test, but this is recording uh, close to the end section of, of this area. Right there, right towards the end. So let me, let me go ahead and uh, play this video, and um, you can follow the the video and you can see 
Um, once we get close to that 400 second mark, um, pay close attention to what's going on on the road so, so that we may understand the cause of these peaks. Okay, so there it is. I see there was a rough patch that caused those massive peak strains. If you didn't catch it, let me pause it and let me rewind it right before we hit that patch. And now pay close attention to the to the bottom um, video display, the rear camera. The, the, the rough road vibrations were more obvious in this angle than the other. So keep uh, paying attention to uh, the, the rear camera. So I'm gonna play this again. And now you can see um, there's quite some vibrations um, in that specific patch. Um, and that's, that's what we see in our time series signal. Okay. So um, that's, that's really helpful. At least I know what caused those peaks. Um, I can understand the test surroundings better. But um, the main objective, the original objectives uh, still stands the same. We still need to find out the fatigue life of our, of our structure. Um, so let me go back to the presentation. Uh, before we get into a software demonstration, um, first we'll review the roadmap of a fatigue analysis process. So this is it. We call it a five box approach. These five boxes define the structure of a standard fatigue process. Um, for any fatigue analysis, we need these three inputs, uh, loading, geometry, and material. Um, in this example, this spike example, the first two inputs, loading and geometry, comes from our measured strain gauge signals. The location where that strain gauge is mounted is considered to be our geometry, and also the life we get, the fatigue life that we get at the end will be based uh, on that location. So the two inputs are covered. Now we have the material, um, the third input. We all know fatigue performance and material properties um, uh, go hand in hand, meaning they are directly related with each other. Once we have assigned um, these three inputs, a series of steps takes place in the center box um, of fatigue analysis. And um, let's see what those steps look like. Okay, so um, this is what's going on in the back end of the center box, the actual core fatigue analysis engine. So you start out, start out with your measured time signal. In this case, we have our measured strain gauge. The next step is to classify the cycles using a method called rainflow cycle counting. So what happens with rainflow cycle counting is that each and every cycle in our test gets classified based on its range. So how big those cycles are, their mean, and also the number of cycles. This way we can then look at this histogram of cycle classification and understand what are my small cycles, uh, where are the big cycles, what are the intermediate cycles, and um, what's their range and, and, and so on. So we get a better understanding of the spread of our cycles based on their range, mean, and their uh, count. The next step then is to come up with some damage. Each and every cycle, whether it's small or big, gets some damage assignment. That damage um, comes from the material properties, okay? So the, for example, the bigger cycles will have more damage, the smaller cycle will have less damage, and so on. At the end of this damage, um, at the end of this uh, uh, histogram uh, process, we come up with the list of all the cycles and their damage assignments. And that makes up this damage histogram. Once we have a damage histogram, uh, as per the minor's rule, we simply take it up and applying this equation, life equals to one over some damage, and that gives us our fatigue life. So fatigue life is nothing but um, a one over the total damage 
uh, the damage coming from each and every cycle. So these are some of the basic steps, the core steps um, happening in the fatigue engine glyph, in the fatigue engine process in the center box of that five box approach. Um, in ENCODE, your typical fatigue analysis process in ENCODE glyphics will look like this. And um, we'll, 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 we'll make this process from scratch. So you can see how easy it is to build uh, a, a fatigue process from scratch using measured signal. So let me now go back to uh, ENCODE. And um, what I what I want to do is add a new workspace. So we have this concept of multiple workspaces in ENCODE. Um, the reason I want to add a new workspace is because everything I see on this workspace, this is this is really neat. It took me some time to configure this. So I don't want to change or remove anything. I can leave it as is. This is for um, um, uh, this is good for reviewing the data. Okay. So now I'm going to add another workspace and make it a uh, fatigue analysis workspace. Okay. So for fatigue analysis process, we don't need all these additional channels. The only channel we care about right now is this channel number 17, which is the um, seat fail strain gauge. Okay. All right, the next step. So again, going back to those five boxes, in the fatigue process, the two inputs are covered. The, the uh, micro, this uh, strain gauge covers loading and the geometry aspect. Now, <clears throat> I need another glyph I'm going to use for fatigue process, which is a strain life glyph. So I go um, find that glyph from the glyph palette and then a display glyph to look at my <clears throat> fatigue results. So once I have these three glyphs, um, I can make these connections. So the green pad says fatigue results. This connects to the fatigue results display. And now we have to assign the third input. The third input is gonna be a material that uh, we are asked to use for this example for this bike and that is a, uh, a chromium based steel SA4130. So once you select your material uh, just hit apply. Uh, there's one more setting I need to make uh, which is changing the KF. So by K the KF by default is set to one. KF is nothing but your fatigue uh, strength concentration factor. Okay. So I'm going to change this from 1 to 1.5. Why? Because um, this is to quantify any stress concentrator beyond what was measured. In this case, in this example, we do have, um, let's say, a stress concentration factor due to the clamp. We're talking about the C drill, so there's a clamp. So we're using a KF, KF of 1.5 to correctly correlate and account for that stress uh, uh, riser caused by the clamp. So those two things I, I assign, <clears throat> assign the care value and also the material, our job is done. So I'm going to click OK and close this and run the process. OK, so the actual process, the core, the key process is just as simple as that. You, have, you need three glyphs input with your measured strain gauge data. You have a strain life glyph, which is doing all the calculations. And then you have a display glyph to show you the results. And now we can see um, answers, uh, fatigue answers in terms of fleet peaks and in terms of life in hours. Okay. So, um, so we have a target, we have a fatigue answer. This part, this bike uh, seat rail is going to last in terms of hours about 1700 hours. That's good, but let me see, before I move on to the next step, let me see what uh, else can I extract out from this strain life glyph? What more information can I gather? Okay, we have all these different color pads and they're there for a reason. What are the 
giving us? What are they telling us? Let's find out. So let me now go and grab a histogram display. And uh, connect these two red pads coming out from the strain life lift to the two red pads of the histogram display. Okay, I'm going to rerun this process. Uh, I'm going to resize some of these display glyphs, make some space, uh, make some bigger, some smaller. Okay, so what we're looking at here, let me uh, maximize this. What we're looking here is the two concepts discussed earlier. Uh, the bottom plot shows rainflow cycle counting. This is the cycle classification we talked about. And the upper plot shows damage histogram. So what this is uh, giving us is uh, the bottom plot first. Um, this is showing us we have a lot of cycles in the smaller range area than we have in, in the higher range area. As you can see, uh, when we go towards higher range, uh, above 2,000 microstrain, the, 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 the scatter gets uh, smaller and smaller, and we have very few cycles in a really high um, um, range area. Now, when we look at that in terms of damage, it's the opposite. All the cycles, all the small cycles that we see um, in the smaller uh, range area um, are not contributing much or at all to the damage. There's no damage coming from those small cycles whatsoever. However, when we look at these bigger cycles, they are the biggest contributors to the damage as well. So all the damage is coming from the cycles bigger than 3,000 or 2,500 microstrain. So this is good information, but can we look at this? Can we validate this uh, scatter, this histogram based on uh, our um, uh, damage versus time plot? Let's see if we can really pinpoint where those damage uh, uh, cycles are coming from, from which section of our test are, are the biggest contributors to this damage. Okay? And that's when we're going to use um, this blue pad. So I'm going to shift everything further down um, and then bring an XY display <clears throat> and connect this with the blue pad. I'm also going to overlay with uh, the original time series data. Rerun the process, and then I'm going to maximize this. Okay, so again, um, the top plot here is nothing but your input time series uh, strain gauge signal, okay? The one we saw already. The bottom one is now the damage versus time. So this is showing you where the damage is coming from as a function of time. So now you can see since the, 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 the raw data and the damage um, uh, time series are uh, side by side, we can see that those big cycles we looked at right around 400 second mark are the biggest contributors in terms of damage. And all these other smaller cycles, um, we don't have any damage from them uh, whatsoever. We have some intermediate spikes in the damage. There are some damage coming up from, some, from intermediate cycle sizes, but uh, not much, but, but, but the bulk of the damage, the core is coming from this segment, this section. Okay, so that's, so that's all that information. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of useful information coming out of this train life cliff. And when used properly and intelligently, this could really enhance the quality of, of, of our analysis. Let me go back to the presentation now um, and see what, what else we have. So going back to the objectives, um, we had to find out, um, did we meet the target life? And here the answer is no. We, we calculated the fatigue life of our structure based on measured loading. And we can see we, we did not meet the target life. The target life was 3,000 hours. Um, uh, we only achieved a life of 1,728 hours. So the answer is big no. We are approximately about 
uh, of our target life. So that brings us to the next question and also our next objective, which is to find out how much stress do we need to reduce um, in order to meet the target life. In other words, we know we need to reduce the stresses, but how do we quantify that stress reduction? So this is a good question and, and, and also uh, a good time for me to introduce a new term called back calculation. So back calculation is one of the key features in ENCODE's strain life glyph. This is used to calculate um, um, quantifiable stresses or strains, uh, uh, stress strain reduction targets or design requirements, such as this one. Here, the design requirement is a target life of 3,000 hours. Um, so this back calculation technique can be used in both scenarios, meaning we can use it when we are under design, like this example here, and also we can use it when we are over designed. So, for example, if we are over designed, um, that means we are already meeting our target, our target life, and beyond. If we could quantify how much over design we are, we could easily implement some design changes. Um, those changes can be like thickness reduction to save the cost, and 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 so on. So um, let's, let's get back to the analysis process of, of our bike example and, and find out how much stress we need to reduce uh, uh, based on the target life of 3,000 hours. Okay. Again, I'm going to leave this as is and add another workspace. And this workspace uh, is dedicated for um, the back calculation of our analysis. A new workspace, and I'm going to steal uh, these two glyphs. So we have this concept of copy and paste in ENCODE. This makes my life easier because now I don't have to bring a new strain life glyph and configure it from scratch, meaning I don't have to assign a new. Again, I don't have to assign the material again. I don't have to change the KF, and if any other properties have been changed, I can simply copy paste it um, and attach. Uh, a new display called fatigue scale factor, and these are pre-configured metadata display glyphs. Okay, and I'm I'm using this uh, pre-configured display glyphs to save some time. Okay, now when doing back calculation, um, we 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 need um, we we need to change two properties. Okay, so I'm going to access the strain life properties. And um, first thing I need to change is change this mode from damage to scale factor. As soon as I change this from damage to scale factor, two new properties come up. <clears throat> and one is uh, saying enter the target life. Okay, so now <clears throat> we need, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, here we need to enter the target life. Now, please note our target life is 3000 hours. Um, this property expects the input <clears throat> in terms of repeats. So we need to do a quick math to find out how much is 3,000 hours in terms of our input time series duration. So <clears throat> if you think about it, if input time series is 480 seconds long, I did the math, the number of repeats that equals to 3,000 hours comes up to be approximately 23,000 repeats. Okay, so that's the, that's the repeats, uh, which equals to 3,000 hours. Okay, once we have the repeat uh, target life information in, I can close this and <clears throat> run this process. So I see two things. Um, I see the scale factor for that seat, straight, uh, seat rail strain gauge shows as 0.93. Okay, so now let me explain what this really means. In the scale factor calculation, we get uh, three types of values. So just remember this. If the scale factor is one, that means you are right on the dot of meeting the target life. If the scale factor is less than one, 
that means we are under design, like what we see here. And if we are above one, that means we are over design. So let's say here the value is 0 0.93, meaning it is less than one, which means we are now under design. We, we, we already know that. Now, if we subtract uh, 0.93 from one, we get 0 0.7. In terms of percentage, that's uh, how much we need to reduce the stresses, about 7%. So one minus 0 0.93 equals to 0 0.7. When you look at that in terms of percentage, that's 7%. So 7% stress reduction is required um, for us to meet the target life. So that's the concept of um, uh, using the strain life analysis glyph to find out whether we meet um, the design criteria, do we meet the target life? And if we don't, then how much stress reduction we need in order to achieve the target life. Okay. So now we have enough information to go ahead and make some uh, design recommendations, design improvements. Uh, we know what the, uh, the under design areas are, and we also know what the target life, how much stress we need to reduce in order to meet the target life. So we have some options on the table um, to make a decision. So now I can go back to my slideshow. And um, look at um, a different topic. So far, we have analyzed fatigue life of a component using a single strain gauge. We use channel number 17, the strain gauge mounted on the seat post, at uh, the seat rail of our bike. But what about multiple strain gauges? What if not we have uh, more than one strain gauge mounted on our bike frame? Uh, it's not just one location we're interested in, we're now interested in understanding the fatigue performance of different um, areas of our bike frame. So um, the good news is ENCODE can handle thousands of gauges at a time, whether we're working with a single gauge, multiple gauge, uh, multiple gauges, uh, or whether we're using a single rosette or multiple rosettes, strain rosettes, the method, the process is the same as, as, uh, as we have done so far. So going back um, uh, to the software, I'm, go I'm gonna do a quick demo using a multi-gauge test data and, and show you how easy it is to use um, a, a multi-channel test uh, to use, uh, to, to, to find out the fatigue life of all the strain gauge locations. Okay. So since I already have this workspace tool configured for um, uh, a forward calculation of a fatigue process. I'm going to use the same uh, uh, workflow and just replace this test, the single channel test with a multi-channel test. So I'm going to right click on this and remove this test. And I have another folder with uh, a, a bike frame uh, test, but here I have um, not one, but five separate screen gauges. So now if I go back here and click five, so I have um, five different screen gauges mounted at different locations of our bike frame. One is in the upper corner, one is in the middle, one is a couple in the cross members and so on. So we have five different screen gauges mounted on five different locations. I can keep everything else the same. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna simply run this process. And if I look at this, if I look at my fatigue results, instead of one answer for one strain gauge, I now have five separate answers for all five strain gauges. The lowest life in this, in this test, in this analysis, comes out to be 546 hours for the uh, upper corner strain, the, the channel number 19, okay? And um, the highest life, the, max, the maximum life is for this, uh, for this strain gauge, um, which comes out to be beyond cutoff, which basically means infinite life. The, the strains at that location are so low that the damage is negligible meaning um, uh, there it's, it's, it's going to last uh, uh, for infinite life. 
So that's that's basically our uh, approach when dealing with uh, multi-test, multi-gauge test. All right, <clears throat> so again, um, this is really cool. We don't need to change anything when we're working with multi-test. It's the same process. Uh, as you can see, we have not changed anything. We use the same template, matter of fact, and just replaced with single, replace a single channel test with a multi-channel test. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, when we talk about durability analysis, there's always a durability schedule involved, meaning we're not calculating a fatigue life for one channel or just one test. It usually is a combination of tests, um, such as we have event A, B, C, E, and so on on a proving ground, and each event will have multipliers assigned to each run. Now, this is typically done to simulate actual customer usage of the product to, to replicate the damage that the, the product may encounter in its service life. So, how do we deal? Um, uh, so, the question is, can ENCODE handle this type of durability schedules? Um, and the answer is yes. Matter of fact, it is very easy to create and use these durability schedules in ENCODE. Um, so let me show you how to build, how to uh, analyze uh, when working with a durability schedule. So far, everything we did is based on a single test or a single channel, but we have not used a complete schedule, a durability schedule. Okay, so I'm going to add a new workspace. And again, I'm going to steal these two uh, glyphs because they're already configured. And uh, a couple things I need to change here. First, when we're working with durability schedules, we're looking at the fatigue results for all channels and all events together. So we're going to use another display called data value display. I'm going to connect data value display there. I'm also going to have to change this uh, input test with a schedule. So I already built a schedule. Um, as you can see here, I have event A, B, C, D. So I have a durability schedule um, that represents uh, that represents four separate events. A, B, C, and D. You can think of these events as your proving ground events, um, pothole one, uh, Belgian block, uh, highway, and things like that. So I have four events, A, B, and C, A, B, C, and D, and I have assigned some multipliers to each. Now, um, one thing I need to change in the properties of strain life glyph is to let it know that we are now using a duty cycle, a durability schedule. So, uh, I just need to turn this from um, false to true and then hit OK and run the process. So what we now get out of this result is some answers based on each channel and each event. So two metrics. So, so two metrics we need to focus here, and uh, they are uh, damage and person damage. So damage, as you can see here, so damage, as you can see here, uh, will be accounted for all events and the repeats using the miners rule. The person damage tells us the specific events damage contribution respect to the other events. And this way we can we can find out um, which channels in which event are most damaging or which events are most damaging when compared with the rest of these events. So this is very useful in understanding uh, the most damaging events or the most damaging channels in, in a schedule. So our conclusion is that um, 
NCROWD can help us review measure test data. Uh, although we haven't seen all its capabilities, our, our focus was fatigue and durability. So we looked uh, these tools and techniques from uh, just the fatigue side of things, but there's a lot more things you can do in order to learn and understand your data, your test data better. Um, so yeah, we, we, we can review measure test data. We can better understand the test uh, um, and could can also help us identify the areas of interest and such. Um, and, and importantly for this example, we, we can we see that the ENCODE uh, can help in fatigue analysis using standard uh, methods like SN or EN methods. Um, ENCODE can handle both strain gauges, strain rosettes, a single test, uh, a multi-test, a durability schedule. It, it can handle all that. 